Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Phys Ed Summit 2016. Uh, we are just about to get started with our afternoon presentations for the East Coast. And uh, we're well into the summit here. We've been going since about 8 o'clock this morning. And I am pumped to, uh, to moderate uh, this session this afternoon. Uh, but I want to thank you first for joining us for 24 hours of back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to -back physical education, professional development uh, sessions, and this global event. We couldn't make this day happen without you. And we're super humbled by the outpouring of support of the physical education community. I think last I checked, we had over 1,600 people who RSVP'd for the summit this year. And by sharing the summit with one person, you're able to impact hundreds of students. So thank you so much for that, for pushing best practices, effective health and physical education, professional development forward. It's an amazing health and PE community, and we're really excited to be a part of it. Uh, reminder that we're using technology, things happen. It's not always our friend. If for some reason the video stops, please check out the Tazzle for the new video link. It may take us a few minutes to get it started and rolling again, but we thank you for your patience. Uh, we have also had some comments today that sometimes the Tazel chat isn't working as well as it should. So if that is you, uh, please start by refreshing your browser. Otherwise, feel free to contact me because I'm here for some technical support and to run uh, the back channel. After the summit, we will post the feedback survey to the Phys Ed Summit 2016 homepage. I believe it actually is already up there. So if you could provide us with some feedback so that we can make next year's event even better, and you will also receive your PD certificate at that time, and I promise you it is a very quick survey. So I wanna introduce our presenters today, and then I'm gonna to toss it over to them because that's who you're here to watch. So we've got two presenters, a co-presentation today uh, with Lynn Gilbert and uh, Dee Castelvecchi from uh, Richmond, Virginia. Lynn is a high school teacher and Dee is middle school. And our topic today is connecting assessment to the four domains of education. Lynn and Dee, I am gonna toss it over to you and the time is yours. Go ahead, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, go I'm ahead. Lynn Gilbert. This is Dee Castlevecki. Um, we are teachers in Chesterfield County in uh, near Richmond, Virginia. And we're going to talk today a little bit about um, assessment. Both of us got really involved with assessment. We are national board certified teachers. So we kind of got pretty involved in assessment as a means of impacting kids and their learning. Um, a lot of my information, and I give credit to Dr. Susan Nye from James Madison University. Um, she really turned me on to different forms of assessment with the domains. And we've gotten a lot of information from Dr. Jackie Lund as well. So I want to give credit to where we've gotten most of our stuff from. Um, as we go through, we're going to talk about the four domains of um, physical education and how to go about assessing those. All right, so we're going to go ahead and pull up our PowerPoint presentation. Just give us a second. There we go. Okay, so when we're talking about assessment, we want to talk about how to assess, why to assess, what to assess. And one of the main questions you want to ask is why actually should you assess in physical education? So it forces us as teachers to look carefully at each student, not the class as a whole, but each student. It helps determine if our program is instructionally aligned with the national standards and your state standards. It also helps us understand the progress students are making, and it's an accountability measure for students and teachers. The purpose that assessment serves is to guide and direct our instruction. It provides student information on their progress, motivates students to improve their performance, and for example, in, I know in my own classes, without an assessment, they're less likely to perform at the level that I know they're capable of. But when they know they're being assessed, 
then they're performing at a higher level because they're trying to meet those standards or exceed the standards that we set for them. To collect objective information on students for grading purposes, make judgment about the effectiveness of my own teaching and to evaluate the curriculum or the program that we are teaching. So what exactly is assessment? I mean, you can look it up as a, as a definition for it. It's a measurement or collection of information um, regarding the student's performance of skills, their knowledge, their attitudes taught in physical education classes. It should answer the following questions. What does the student know how to do? And then instructionally, assessment should answer the question, what does the student need to learn? And, and for us as educators, um, those are huge in guiding how we set our instruction and how we set our uh, units. There are two types of assessment. Informal assessment, also known as formative assessment. That is to get knowledge of what the students know or how they're able to perform as you are leading up to a final project or a final skill. So it's the, um, the creation of your final result. And that part, it's not, not supposed to be an issue of a grade, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Formal assessment or your summative assessment, that is for a grade, but that is to get the final outcome of what your students have learned. So formative is their development so that you can see where they are and where you need to get them. And then summative is that end result. Now, as far as grading, I said formative is not to issue a grade. However, in some areas, for example, in our county, we are required to give formative grades and summative grades. And it's on a 60-40 percentage. So the 40% would be our formative grade and the 60% would be our summative grades. You want to give the higher percentage to the outcome or the end result of what they've learned. Okay, so what are we actually assessing? So as physical educators, <clears throat> we're trying to assess in the four domains. And I, I, I know before I started going through National Board, I, I had a lot of information and I was spewing that information out and I thought I was doing a really nice job, but I was not impacting students' learning at all. Um, I started getting more involved in assessment. I realized, well, there are a lot of different areas in which we can assess. The cognitive domain, I think most people, that's one of the first things they think about. It's what do the students know, what do they understand? And then your health-related physical fitness, how, how are we showing improvements on their fitness level? Because when all is said and done, we really should be driving toward that. And then your psychomotor skills, I think for physical educators, that's one of the bigger things that we think about assessing. Um, what students are able to do and perform. And then the effective domain many times is a forgotten um, domain. It's their, your attitudes, their attitudes and beliefs about whatever they're performing in physical education. So as you go through, as we're going through the presentation, kind of think about units that you teach and where you might be able to put an assessment in for each of those domains as you go through. All right, so these here are the Shape America standards. And when you are doing your assessments, whatever your standards are um, from where you're from, you want to make sure that your assessment is matched up with the standards. So when we are assessing, we are addressing each of these five standards. And then within our states um, and even within our counties with our curriculum, you want to make sure that you are addressing and aligning your, your assessment to actually assess the standards that you are supposed to be teaching to your students. I'm going to talk a little bit more about formative assessment. It does the following things. It involves the student in the process of assessment and goal setting. So the students know what they're being assessed on. A lot of times with this, we do peer assessment or self-assessment, so students are involved in that process. They, they have to be able to understand the criteria and then evaluate each other or themselves on where they are in that process. 
Um, it motivates students to improve their performance. It allows for teaching effectiveness. Provides teachers information on current student status in relation to learning objectives. Places students in appropriate instructional groups. So if you're grouping based on skill or you're grouping based on um, content knowledge or I mean, however you're grouping your students, you're able to use this information to help with that. Provides teachers with objective information for grading, and then it maximizes probability of instructional alignment. All right, so your summative assessment, um, that should reflect student achievement of unit goals. That's gonna be your end product. It could be uh, a number of things, your post skills test, end of unit presentations, written tests, portfolios, class projects, journals, skill labs, fitness logs, authentic assessment and gameplay, all of that could be considered summative. I know for myself, um, I'm, I'm a little bit more geared toward lifetime fitness. So for me, uh, for instance, this year, I'll create a Tough Mudder for my ninth graders. So that'll be their final exam at the end of the year. And everything they do up until that point, they have to demonstrate that they've completed fitness levels to be able to compete in the Tough Mudder. So that would be a summative assessment. Uh, another one I've done with middle school, because I did teach middle school for four years, um, was a Fit for Life adventure race, where I have kids, we train and we work and we work together throughout the year to get to that point. So I, I try to connect it so that what we're doing in physical education is transferable after life, after they get out of school. And then my thing um, that I'm going to talk about next is your uh, effective domain, the assessment of the effective domain. And this is one of the things that a lot of times is, is kind of left out. Um, when the effective domain is assessed correctly, it's going to measure the development of acceptable social and personal behaviors. So it allows you to have your students self-assess to reflect on their own behavior and then by doing that, it, it's instant feedback for them. Um, so they can set goals for their own improvement. So they're trying to move forward with the um, effective domain. And a lot of times when we're doing this, um, we use peer assessment, which is huge with um, the effective domain. They have to be able to work together to assess each other. Okay, and then why should we assess in the effective domain? Uh, your students need to know the behaviors that you consider important and that you're going to be holding them accountable for, for their actions. It's, you're actually, for us, with the SHAPE standards, we're tapping into civic responsibility, um, acceptable social behaviors. A common behavior trait um, is effort, willingness to participate, um, fair play, sportsmanship, and then willingness to cooperate, their teamwork. Uh, I spend the first part of my year trying to build a community within the classroom. So I, I'm really highlighting on this um, so that we can learn that individual differences are actually strengths as a whole. So we spend a lot of time talking about the effective domain. It's very transferable to life. Um, they may represent different things to different people. So it's up to us to decide what we consider most important traits um, for your classes. If students care about others and act in ways to show that they care, then the class is typically going to function more efficiently and effectively, and, and that's just a little micro of what the world they're going to be living in is. So we're teaching life skills with the effective domain. Um, when effective temperaments are assessed, you'll be able to direct your students toward becoming more responsible young adults. So they're improving also their emotional climate and the emotional climate of the class. So how do we assess in the effective domain? First, you need to define the behavior. What do you think is acceptable? Um, and we've given you guys some examples of some of this in uh, the handouts we loaded onto Tazel. Next, you have to identify the actions that are acceptable indicators of students meeting your expectations for the trait. Once you have the behaviors and the acceptable indicators, then you can start using checklists, rating skills, rubrics, journals. 
personally I love journaling uh, event recording exit slips uh, written test all of that you can use as assessments journaling is is awesome because then you're getting a real personal view of what they're actually thinking um, the next few slides we're going to show some examples of the different types of, uh, of assessments and um, a lot of these were from Jackie Lund and some that we've what we've loaded onto Tassel are uh, what D and I have created. So levels of responsibility checklist. With that, you're going to have your kids actually doing that checklist. Um, that would be like a, a more of a middle school checklist. I, I probably would not use that in high school. I would use that more in a middle school setting. You could also tag that in with um, the sports ed model with middle school. Badminton peer assessment. Um, Dee and I are both are a huge fan of peer assessment because you're knocking out multiple domains with one assessment, but they actually have to pay attention to what is going on within their group, and they have to be able to function together to do this. And then this one would be a teacher, an example of what a teacher would use. Um, and I would use it more as an authentic assessment while the game is going on or while you you have them actually doing stuff. I would be assessing, okay, they're working together well, that type of stuff. Journal prompts, this is my favorite, uh, especially if you do anything like project adventure, team building activities, you really want to get their feedback, what do they think's going on, because then you know the um, kind of the climate of, the, uh, of your classroom where things are going. Um, event recording, you could do this. I, I typically do not do this type of stuff, uh, but that would be uh, an avenue you could travel. Uh, I would not use that in high school, maybe early middle school. And then your anecdotal records. So you may be, as the students are doing things, jotting down and journaling. I do do that. I reflect after each class. Um, about how the class went, where I could change things, what might make it better. And then written test. Um, this is just for the kids to understand what is correct etiquette in a sport, uh, what would be considered maybe inappropriate. And then the types of activities that highlight the effective domain. Um, project adventure activities, uh, that's a team building type um, program where you start out trying to build a community in your classroom and it goes all the way up to high ropes elements with Project Adventure, but it is huge on uh, creating an understanding of differences in your classroom. Um, and then the team building activities itself, uh, it's interesting to watch the kids work together and realize that maybe Jimmy is not real strong in this area, but excels in a different area so it highlights uh, strengths rather than weaknesses the team building does and then your team sports model is where you're assigning different responsibilities for members of a group um, maybe they're going to be the coach or the record keeper or the equipment manager so you've given them different um, responsibilities for class and it changes throughout the year the responsibilities do Okay, right, now we're going to talk about the cognitive domain, which, as Lynn said earlier, this is one that most of us are familiar with and we use. Right here on this slide, it goes through the different um, levels of Bloom's taxonomy, which most of us have heard about, so I'm not going to read through that. But those are the different areas for the cognitive domain for assessment. Um, the types of formative assessment for cognitive. You could do observations. That's... And we all always are going to use teacher observation when we assess. I would not have that be our end-all, be-all. And we hear it a lot with students coming out of college where that's their way that they assess. But we really need to be assessing in other ways as well. So yes, you can use observations, but other ways also. So homework, you could assign homework assignments. I know I've sent um, fitness logs and journals and stuff uh, for them to do at home reflection journals, question and answer session. So that would be, for me, that would be my closure at the end of class with 
my closure usually it's now some days I will just ask them some questions at the end and usually a few students are answering those questions um, but I usually have a written assessment that they've done that has those questions on it so yes I'm hearing out loud what these few kids are saying as their answers and we can discuss it and kids can get ideas from other students to piggyback off what they're saying for their answers but I also have that written version so I know what every student in the class has said to answer those questions. Um, conferences between student and teacher. In-class activities where students informally present their results. So it might be that we've just done a learning lab and I'll ask students, well, what did you find out? Why do you think that? Why do you think that when you were doing jumping jacks, your heart rate skyrocketed, but when you were sitting and doing a sit and reach, it was lower? Well, why was your heart rate the same as this person over at this station, but the person at your station right next to you, your heart rates were different. What could cause that to happen? So we get into things like intensity. Um, student feedback, by answering questions about the instruction. So you can ask them questions and just get instant feedback and self-evaluation of performance and progress. And then summative assessment. That's after all of, all of the learning has happened. Learning has happened and then they give you information based on the entire unit. So you would develop a rubric around a set of standards or expectations. They can be given to the students before the assignment so they know exactly what they have to do for each of the criteria. Rubrics can also help you to grade more objectively. Summative assessments should ask the question, is the student effectively able to progress to the next part of the class and should be product oriented assess that final product. So some of the types of assessment for summative would be exams, term papers, projects, portfolios, performances, and student evaluation of the course or they're evaluating their teacher effectiveness. Personally, I use projects, I use portfolios, and within those portfolios, a lot of my assessments, and you'll see once we get to some of the assessments later, my assessments will hit all four domains. So within the portfolio, they will have a cognitive piece in there, but they'll also have all the other three domains in there as well. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the health-related fitness of it. And um, with the health-related fitness, so we had a technical issue. Exercise um, activities that you do in order to try to improve your physical health and stay healthy. So uh, everything that we've been talking about so far with the formative and the summative, it, it, it's all an attempt to try to make an impact on, on, the, on the kid or the student so that it's not just a, a process that I have to do this to pass the class. We're trying to have some form of impact to get them to where they understand their self a little better and what they're capable of doing and where they wanna go eventually. So health-related uh, fitness tests, um, that would be a, a formative. Um, as they're going along, you're trying to see improvement over time. The fitness journal, um, fitness logs, the, those two are, would be huge with my end product with the, the Tough Mudder or the um, Fit for Life race. Uh, class projects, um, and I'll have an example of one on here where they're creating a jump rope routine. That would be a summative. And then the portfolios can be a formative and a summative throughout, throughout the year. All right, so this is a sample uh, fitness goal setting form. So what I like to do is at the very beginning of the year, okay, so what do you think you're capable of doing? And I have them write their goal. Um, and then I'll do it, some type of test with them, whatever I've had down there for their fitness components. And then they have to come up with activities that they can do to try to improve each of those components of fitness. Now, I really want them to figure it out. Now, I, I teach ninth and 10th graders. I want them to start thinking critically and analytically. I want them to figure things out. So they would come up with a plan. Then they would test again, and then at the very end of the year, we would have a final score so they can actually see from where they were from the beginning to the end, and hopefully they'll show some improvement. And hopefully, 
gain some understanding of how they can improve each component. And this is an example of a formative. Um, we use pedometers. Uh, the pedometers that I used this past year were great. They downloaded the data, but a lot of us do not have that. Uh, school I'm going to this year, I won't have that. So I have the students record their step count and their MBPA time or their activity time. And then I have them um, assess their participation during the day. Uh, and then down at the bottom, that's where they're putting their rating. And then I put a rating beside it. And it, I usually put this on an index card. Uh, I keep the pedometers. I got this idea from Misty Wojciechowski in a shoe bag. And that's where they're recording the stuff. Um, but I'm giving the kids an idea or a, a chance to rate yourself, which I'm hitting the effective domain. And then I tell them what I really think they did <laughs> during that day. And then just to piggyback on this, one additional piece that I've added into mine, and Lynn, you may have done this before also, but I'll have them chart it. So there's a bar graph of what they mm -hmm. have done throughout so they can see. It's more of a visual for my middle schoolers versus just seeing numbers. Um, so doing the bar graph, plus it ties in some math. So you're doing that cross-curricular. All right, this is just a sample of a summative. Um, I did a jump rope routine where I had the kids get in groups and it's uh, kind of like a PBL basically. It's, I gave them a problem and they had to solve it. Um, the uh, jump rope maneuvers are uh, another Dr. Nye thing, but the kids had to come up with how they could implement all this into a jump rope routine. Um, and it forced them because they worked in, I believe I had four people in a group. They, they had to determine which student would be best at which particular skill. Um, then they had to put it together. This, this probably took them about two weeks because it had to be synchronized. And then they presented it. I ended up videoing all of it. Um, and this was one of, uh, this was actually one of my national board entries. But as you go through, the next slide, this is how I evaluated them. So they had a copy of the requirements, and then they had a copy of how they were going to be evaluated. And then they, they did a big thing with the jump, uh, with their heart rate during that activity because I wanted them to connect that, hey, this is fun. This is to your own music, but look, you've elevated your heart rate quite a bit. So that would have been obviously a summative. And the psychomotor domain. So this is what the students are able to physically do and their skill performance. So what skill will you assess? When you're, when you're looking at the psychomotor domain, you really need to figure out what skills you want to assess. So depending on the unit, because we all know we only have so much time with our students for a unit, we need to make sure that we are assessing the skills that we feel are the most important or the ones that the students really need to have in order to be successful with the end product that we want them to get. So what skills, how much time do you have to assess these skills? When will you check the skill and how will you provide feedback to the students so they can improve their skills? And that would be your formative assessment. And then when and how will you complete an assessment to see what students learned? And that's your summative assessment. So formative, students need to be assessed frequently to provide feedback and allow for skill corrections. And this should be happening daily. Every time you have students in class and you're teaching a skill, you're providing feedback, whether it's verbal feedback or they're doing peer feedback to each other through written assessment. I use video feedback a lot. So I, the, I'll have um, students partnered. They will, one partner will videotape the other partner while they're performing a skill and then they will assess themselves or that partner will be doing a peer assessment or sometimes it's a combination of both and they can compare plus then that way I can look at that video I can have both of those assessments sitting in front of me to see what they said they did in that video and then I can get a cognitive assessment out of it because if partner A says that yes they did this skill and I'm looking at that video and it's clear that they did not do that skill well partner A doesn't cognitively understand understand what that skill should look like 
So there I've gotten a psychomotor and a cognitive assessment. Peer assessment, self-assessment, and teacher assessments can all be used to provide feedback. And then video assessment, which I just talked about, and written assessments are also helpful tools to help students improve their skill. And this too, the peer assessment is, is golden because it's psychomotor, it's cognitive, and it's the effective domain because they have to function together as a unit. So that, that is a golden Assessment. Right. And we found, and I, I know a lot of people hesitate using peer assessment because they're afraid, well, if their partner is their person assessing them, they're just going to say, yeah, they did it. But when you add that video piece, they hold each other accountable. And a lot of times they are harder on each other than you are, you would be when you're assessing their skills. So they are very brutally honest about each other's skill. Um, it's one of the things you do have to teach with peer assessment is that they need to be able to give feedback appropriately. So, and then that goes in with that effective domain. So for summative assessment, um, the summative assessment should be complete at the end of the unit. The assessment should measure the improvement for each student and provide the student with information about their individual growth. And it can be completed as a video assessment with written assessment, peer, self, and teacher, or teacher observation with written assessment. Um, one of the things that I do with my summative, like for example, in my archery unit, when we're working on shooting in archery, they'll do an assessment at the beginning, they'll work on those skills throughout, and then at the end, we have that same peer and video assessment that we had at the beginning. So they're being assessed the same exact way on those same exact skills, so they know what's coming. And I'm not creating anything new for that. And another thing with the summative, so for instance, as they, let's say I'm doing a flag football unit. I'll, I'll do an authentic assessment as they're having gameplay. And I'm, I'm not just assessing their ability to, to complete the skill. I'm also assessing their, especially with flag football, their ability to design plays. Do they cognitively understand strategy? Has there been improvement in their skill level? So I, I usually do it with the high school kids as an authentic. And here's an example of one, and I have modified this. We create assessments all the time, and as we use them, sometimes you realize that the assessment is missing something. You're not quite getting the information that you wanted to get from it, and that's okay, because you're assessing, you're getting information, and if you need to fix it, fix it. It's not, it's not a total fail, but for this one, I have the cues for the bump. These are the four cues that I was looking for, and then they were to answer, they would put a one if they answered yes to um, one of the cues, two if they answered yes to two of them, and so on. So then when I went to the form, bump to self. How many do they complete? What's their cue score? And then I added their heart rate, so I had a fitness level. Well, what I've changed now, instead of number completed, it doesn't matter how many they complete, they're supposed to complete that station until... Um, it's time to switch stations, but I do look for a cue score and then instead of the number completed Which cues did they not? Complete that was the piece I was missing because okay, you got a two Well, which two did you do correctly and which two did you need to work on and that was something that just totally I missed it But I have fixed it since then and now it works much better for me as an assessment and then if you look at the bottom We've got questions, so the cognitive domain is in there. Which station raised your heart rate the highest? Why do you think it was higher at this station? So some higher level thinking also. Describe how to perform the bump. When and why would you use the bump in a game of volleyball? So we're hitting lifetime. Um, how can you play volleyball for fun outside of school? And then a reflection on their experience. So I'm hitting that effective domain. Now, a couple things with the psychomotor. I like to do um, pretest and have um, skill stations set up around uh, wherever area I have to teach in. And I like to do a pretest. That way, and it's more of a peer assessment with the pretest. They're usually working in groups of three where they're videoing. And I'm getting an understanding of what they totally understand about the skill or not. And it helps me to know how to set my class up. So am I gonna have NFL, college, and high school level? 
Am I going to have a lot of kids that need a lot of remediation? And in high school, uh, probably not so much as in middle school, with such a drastic gap, but you'll have varsity athletes and then you'll have some, some kids that just want to have fun. So you want to make sure that you have them leveled correctly. And the pretest is one of the best ways to do it. Plus you're getting a starting point to judge where they are by the end of the unit. Have I moved them forward? H have they improved on their skill? Because if, if I can't say yes to that, then I want to reflect on how I presented the unit. So the psychomotor is, for me, is big to allow me to level my class. All right, now we're going to show you a video. This video is from my national board entry, so I, I do have permission from all of the students and their parents to use them. But this is a video um, on my bicycle safety unit. And there were stations set up around the perimeter of the tennis courts. So I'll go ahead and play some You're of that. You're going to want to take your headphones out of this if there's sound. Good. All right, so there's also, there's different levels. So we've got the hey, different stop. Make sure you stop all the way. Put that foot down. And there student you go. choice. Giving feedback to students. Hey, jump on. Let me see. Good stuff. Make sure shift your weight back. But good stuff. And put that foot down to stop yourself all the way. So one of the things. So one of the. Noticed when I went back and when I watched this and as I was assessing was that a lot of my students were not putting their foot down on that skill. So that was something I needed to reteach. All right, switching up. So um, for us, if you notice the, the last couple minutes, we talked about leveling our classes. We're trying to create um, an environment <clears throat> that's emotionally okay for the kids, um, but we're trying to do it in a way that is leveling them skill-wise so that they are comfortable in who they are and they're more likely to continue to do the activity and hopefully it will turn them on to doing whatever we presented as an option the rest of their life. So. We're using assessment more to guide us than we are to, as a grade. It oh, helps definitely. us move kids forward. So I think that's all we have. If there were any questions. Awesome. I have some questions for you. Um, I've been watching the back channel on Tazel and, and some folks have asked some good questions and we'll take any more that come in there. So I was really happy the, uh, your video turned out great, looks great, and we could all hear it. And that, that was awesome. Okay. So thanks for sharing. So my fr <laughs> I have a couple questions from participants, and then I was frantically writing down my own questions <laughs> for, for selfish reasons. <laughs> so, so I have some of those. So I, I'll start with the, the big one that I'm thinking about is with peer assessment. And I teach middle school, so it's particularly like with middle school. Um, you know, when... Middle schoolers are not born with the skill set to peer assess accurately and effectively. So how do you go about teaching students to become good at peer assessment so that when the inevitable inaccuracy happens, uh, you can build, I guess, um, consistency, or maybe not consistency is not the word, but you can build their skills in being able to peer assess. Well, so, take it. Sure. One of the things that I do, I want to make sure that they understand cognitively first. 
So if they don't understand it cognitively, it's really hard for them to be able to peer assess. Um, I also, that's the reason I use a lot of video assessment, so that I can see what those students are actually doing. So if Lynn is assessing me, and she has no idea what she's really looking at in assessment, I have the video as the teacher, the video so I can see what that student actually did. And I do take the time to look at these videos so that I can see what they're doing for their assessment. And then I also find out, well, Lynn assessed this all wrong. Now I need to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with Lynn and talk to her and figure out well, what is it you're not understanding? How can we help you? Let me reteach this to you so you can have that cognitive understanding so you would be able to peer assess. When I get these assessments back at the middle school level, sometimes, I mean, you know sometimes they just check yes all the way down. They don't mm -hmm. feel like doing it, whatever. But that's why I have that video. And they know that I'm videotaping and I'm going to see what they did. And it's built that to where more and more of them as they go through the year and get to know what I'm doing. And that, yes, she did look at that video. And yes, she is looking at these assessments. Then they're more, I guess they're more motivated to learn kind of force motivated to learn because they're being graded on this, but um, it does improve as the year goes on. Well, and I found when I use it um, as Oops, a means to, like as a pretest, um, I have found, and I had kids, and I worked at a, a very difficult high school this past year. I had kids saying, oh, here, she doesn't have the papers out. I mean, they're waiting <laughs> to get the peer assessment. And what I typically do with them is the first unit, I walk them through this. These are the expectations. If you don't understand it cognitively, that's telling me where I need to level it. I do not use peer assessment for summative. I only use it as a formative because it's directing my teaching. Mm -hmm. My summative in the, on the high school level is, is an authentic where I'm watching them in game play. So. Well, and I have actually just to piggyback on that, I have had assessments specifically in my archery where it was just so overwhelming with information that I had, I realized once the kids weren't getting it, when they're peer assessing, I had to um, make it smaller. And I have fixed those things as I do that. Yeah, it's a lot of trial and error. Uh, Joe oh, Bailey definitely. mentioned in the back channel of the Tozzle, and this is something that, um, that I kind of tried this past year is it was helpful for us with our kids is to have like, particularly with video, have like an example that's no one in the class and maybe it's a previous year. And then you have a practice template where the entire class gets to practice peering assessing this particular oh, video. That is. Yeah, I like that. Is a, is a way to teach it. That was, Joe mentioned that. And that was, we did that actually. I didn't do it with peer assessment, but we did it when we were teaching kids how to score keep in, um, in sport ed. Yeah, yeah, that's a, awesome. We, we had like a, a whole like scorekeeper form and we found kids just were not good at filling out what needed to be filled out. And so we, we had like a practice game uh, that was like a two minute video and, and we had kids practice scorekeeping the entire class all at one time. Um, and that really helped. <laughs> so yeah, that's, I do too. <laughs> I like that a lot. See, we're, we're bouncing ideas off each other. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll make a, a better product for the kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, okay, next question uh, is another one from me, uh, just because I try to get a gauge when I try to um, I think about my own classroom, is how, how often do you see your kids in your classes, and, and how big are your class sizes that you teach? Uh, I'll take that one. Um, I see my kids every other day. Um, and my class size, the largest I've had in high school was 36. So about 36 and we have typically three classes in one regulation size gym, basketball court. When we're inside and outside, we have, obviously have a lot more room, but I don't typically have over 36. I, I know middle school is more. <laughs> well, my, my school is a little more. spoiled, but, um, most of the schools in the county that have about 40 or so. My school, my biggest this year is 32. Oh. I hope nobody heard me say that from our county. Well, <laughs> but and that's but still, have, I mean, it's still a tiny. It is. I mean, I mean, it's still it big. Is. I mean, right. Yeah. 
Um, and for us, and I think y'all do the same thing, we alternate two weeks in physical education, two weeks in health. So I see my kids every other day. So I have five days in a two-week period in physical education. And then the next two weeks, it's five days in health. Now, I do, I use some of my health time to do some of the instruction and the cognitive pieces and some of the cognitive assessment pieces in health. So that does help some of the safety stuff that they need to know, like for archery, I do that in the health classroom. Now for us, this will be the first year I'm going to a new high school. It'll be, um, we have one day of health, one day of PE, one day of health, one day of PE. So I'll at least have them in physical education at least once every week. Whereas before we'd go two weeks, I not see them. Yeah. Well, I think, I think what you're describing for your teaching situations are very similar to a lot of people. <laughs> um, and and that, that's why I like asking that question because um, it, it seems like it's, it, you fall right in the middle. You don't have, a, you don't have <laughs> class sizes that are like 100 because I know teachers who have 100, but yeah. also I know some <laughs> teachers who are super lucky who have like 18. And oh, higher than 18 wow. Other. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not happening. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah. Uh, next question is from Chris, and I think Chris, Coach Core, I think he might be in New Orleans if I remember right. Um, and he has a question is, do you have, like, for all of your assessments for each student, do you put together, like, a notebook or a folder, like, portfolio? Is it hard copy or is it digital? How do, how do you go about doing that? Uh, now, that's a good question because we've both been trying to change our portfolio to digital, and I think we may be able to swing that this year. But right now, both of us, uh, D calls her. She's portfolios. Portfolio. <laughs> I just call mine a portfolio. Um, and we do – I take them out every day mm -hmm. and I usually will get the question from teachers um, that just takes too much time to do that no, not really it takes maybe two minutes at the most um, but yeah we keep a portfolio and I give my kids their portfolio at the end of the year mm -hmm. when they leave and it's really cool because well I mean at one time we had heart rate data but and we're working on getting that again. But we, um, with the pedometer data, when we do group conferences, I've had other teachers, they're like, well, y'all do what? And they're looking at what we're doing and they're seeing, so we're advocating for our program. Plus parents are seeing what we're doing. This isn't PE that you had back in whenever. This is a totally different thing. And yes, they're actually learning information so they can be healthy for the rest of their life. And I had one teacher, her daughter was in my class she was in a conference. She saw the portfolio. She said, well, does my daughter have one? I want to see it. So parents get excited about that, um, seeing the assessment so they can see where their kids are and what their kids are doing. It helps us too because mm -hmm. they're stored in one place. So from the beginning to the end, you can kind of, you know, go through them. Oh, we didn't do very well with that. <laughs> yeah. So it does help us. <laughs> I, I feel like we do, I do folders, like for as digital as I am, I, I mean, I do folders just because it's very tangible. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so many of our kids don't have access to where I teach to technology tools yeah. at home. And so I feel like it's motivating for kids too, because it's like, when you talk about learning in physical education, this is like living proof that we are actually uh -huh. learning today in PE right. or this year. Right. Uh, next question. This one create, created kind of a buzz um, on the Tazzle <laughs> when you mentioned it. And so, and Joe Bailey would like you to talk more about it. Um, but some people had some very positive reactions the second that you said for a summative assessment in high school, it was a tough mutter for your oh, final yes. exam. So <laughs> yes. people want to hear more about the tough mutter. Okay. <laughs> so um, a few years ago, I created an adventure race for the middle school kids. Myself and Misty Wajahowski, we created it. We have like 200 kids doing this. So when I went back to high school, I wanted to do something that I felt would be impactful for the kids to engage with them. So I'm, I'm going to a new school this year, and I've already sat down with the principal and said, look, how, how do you feel about using a tough mutter as a final exam? She said, hmm, so is that a yes or a no? Because I don't know her very well, but she said, absolutely. I said, now here's the thing with it. They have to be able to document that they have performed the physical training to be able to compete in the Tough Mudder. The kids are going to design it. 
um, the obstacles and the tough mudder it has to obviously get approved by risk management but um I have them designing their own specific workouts to be able to reach that level and they have to document that they're doing the parents have to sign off on it and then I, we're going to try to create a, a community tough mudder as a fundraiser to help pay for the heart rate monitors <laughs> we're trying to get but uh, <laughs> um, but it went over real well because I'm taking everything that we're teaching in class and now I'm putting it into practice. Now if they do not do not want to do it and the Tough Mudder will have different levels so different challenges so I'm not isolating a kid that maybe is not in the best of shape you can't do this because that's too high. So it'll be different levels of challenges for each obstacle and they have to document that they can do it. If, if they choose to not do that as their final exam, they'll have to take a normal written exam. But I, I really think that is uh, a gauge of where are we and how much impact have we had on, on the kids. Can they train to do that? Yeah, but I, she was all about it. Now, most principals I've worked under, I've been doing this, this is my 31st year of teaching. Um, most of them are very receptive to my off-the-wall thoughts. Um, I've not had one say no, but yeah, it, it was approved, so I'm I'm pretty excited to get it going. Plus, it's real world, so it's something when they yeah. get out of school and they're not in physical education, then they can do you it. know what? I've done one before, so I'm going to sign up for this one. So it gets them flipping, their keeps switch. them active. Yeah, the the mm -hmm. ones we did with the adventure race, I actually have had six kids come back <laughs> after they graduated and have competed. So hopefully, we're having a little impact. Hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely wrote that down too. I'm going to be sharing that with our high school uh, teachers in my district because they um, they started several years ago. Their final exam in the high school PE classes is like is performance based, and it's uh, I think if I remember, it's like a 30 minute continuous run where it's not how far you go or how fast you go, but it's a 30 minute continuous run, and they. They build up to it throughout the entire semester and, and training and stuff like that. And the first time I heard that, that our final was like a 30 minute run, I was like, you're crazy. Like, that's nuts. And the more, and that was like probably five years ago. And the more I've thought about it, I'm just like, uh, and we were talking about it at our PLC day this week mm -hmm. when teachers reported back. And I was like, you know what? That's like, that's really not a bad idea. That's like, real you know, life. Right. it's real life. Because yeah, what do you do when you go for a run in real life? You, you don't. Well, some people do, but not everyone keeps track of how fast their pace is, or not everyone <laughs> is like, you, you know, training for something, but they just, like, I'm going to go for like a 20, 30 minute run or whatever mm -hmm. it is. And um, so and they, they said it's been very positive for their, with their classes. So I'm going to throw that by them to say, hey, what about a Tough Mudder or a Spartan race or something like oh, that? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's awesome. Of, yeah. They can do their own stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay. We are actually out of time, uh, Lynn and Dee, and I have, uh, doesn't look like there's any other question now, but there was some great conversation going out in the Tazel, and uh, I'm going to have to bounce here because I have to pop in with a session with Andy Hare here in about five minutes. So, uh, okay. um, well, but definitely, you. yeah, it was, it was a great session. Really appreciate you presenting. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. So um, I'm sure there's some people who would like to connect with you on, on the Tazel or on the, um, on Twitter. Um, and so one thing, maybe uh, I'll, I'll put the link to the Tazel in your, um, in the chat box right here. And maybe you can check it out a little bit and give some people your contact information and uh, so they can follow up. And again, thank you so much for presenting and I'm going to sign it off here. And, uh, and we got one more now checked off and thanks for sharing your, your thank thoughts you. and ideas on assessment. Thank you. And we,